I have better news today. Our case counts are falling. I'll update you on the epidemic and then where we are with our vaccine program. First, the numbers. Uh, since this time yesterday, we've identified 103 new cases of the coronavirus infection uh, in Philadelphia residents confirmed by the PCR test. For total confirmed case count since the beginning of the epidemic of 110,836. Now, since yesterday, we've reduced the number of people who counted as having problem with cases by the rapid antigen test by three because these are people who subsequently had a positive PCR test. And for the past week that ended on February 13th, we averaged 242 cases per day. That's the PCR test and the antigen test combined. That's so far, and we expect more. And of those people tested, 3.8% of the people tested positive. Now, for comparison, the previous week that ended on February 6th, we averaged 323 cases per day, and 5.3% of the people who tested were testing positive. Now, that, even that 5.3% is lower because we had many previously unidentified negatives that came into our data. These numbers overall are showing a significant decrease in the past few weeks. Our case counts are falling, and they're also falling uh, in the state of Pennsylvania and in New Jersey and the United States as a whole. It's really good to see this continued downward trend. Now, where are we with deaths? Uh, as the mayor said, uh, we are just at over 3,000 now, 3,001 deaths total, uh, zero identified since yesterday. And that's many deaths, as the mayor talked about. Uh, this has been very tough on the city of Philadelphia, been tough on Philadelphia individuals and on families. We hope we're nearing the end of this, uh, but the epidemic certainly has been difficult as we, we mark on that milestone. Now, in the month of January, the number of deaths we're experiencing per week uh, has been falling. Uh, we were at 92 in the first week of January, and so far on the January 31st week, we are at 37. Now, I expect more of those recent weeks, but that downward trend is clear. Now, let me talk about where we are with vaccination. Um, remember, we have three guiding principles with our vaccination effort. We're trying to deliver our doses we get as fast as possible and do it in the way that saves the most lives uh, and to do it with racial equity. And we're having to work on all three. Let me first talk about our supply of that vaccine. Our supply has been increasing and there's hope that we'll continue to increase in the future. Now, last week that was allocated to us for delivery this week, approximately 10,700 doses of the Pfizer vaccine, that's 10,700 first doses, um, and the Moderna vaccine, there was an increase to 15,600 first doses, plus an additional 4,900 first doses of Moderna vaccine that were shipped directly to Rite Aid and ShopRite. These numbers are an increase. Now, I do have to note here that some of these doses that were allocated last week for delivery this week will, are likely to not arrive as scheduled because the bad weather has caused flight cancellations. They may arrive days later or they may arrive even the subsequent week. But uh, and that number is nonetheless an increase. And then this week uh, allocated for delivery next week is somewhat similar, but there may be a further increase in the number of Pfizer doses. Now, the federal government has told us they could guarantee that we're gonna get it no less than what we've been getting this week for at least the next three weeks. After that though, they, it's unclear. Now they have said that their best estimate is that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine may arrive approximately March 1st, although the number of doses we will get on that is unclear. And then, as the mayor said, uh, very important, last week the White House reported that they had purchased additional doses from Pfizer and Moderna, that the, the, the country would have a total of 600 million doses by the end of July. That's really important, 600 million doses by the end of July. That's enough for nearly the entire U.S. population by the end of July. And that means to me that we should be expecting more in the future, although exactly what rate at which the number of doses arriving will increase is completely unclear at this point. With these increases, it does mean that the limiting that factor now is shifting from how many doses come into the city to how quickly we can deliver those doses. Now we are working to increase our delivery channels to match that and more on that in a minute. So let's talk about where we are so far with our administration and the doses that are available to us. As of uh, midnight on Sunday, we had reports in the vaccination for 151,946 people with the first dose and then 71,949 with the second dose. Now, those numbers are an undercount. Uh, with the holidays, there's been some delay in reporting so that that data is incomplete. Those numbers should rise when we have more information. Now, there's a new metric that I wanna be talking about on a weekly basis to measure how well we're doing is uh, delivering the doses that are available to us. That'll be the total number of doses administered by week. That's either first doses or second doses combined. We won't we'll make a distinction. Now we count our weeks because of the way our database is set up from a Monday through the Sunday. So for that week that ended on February 7th, 
uh, we delivered, or the city of Philadelphia providers combined delivered 35,668 doses. That was an all time high at that point. But so far the next week that ended on February 14th, uh, we know that we've delivered at least 44,000 doses. So a substantial increase. Uh, and we expect that there's gonna be more because we haven't got complete reporting yet for that past week. So I'll be reporting that number of weekly doses delivered first and seven combined uh, on a weekly basis. And we do expect that number to increase with the number of increase in doses that we're receiving and with more providers being enrolled and with increased vaccination by each provider. That's what's happening citywide. Also, let me just focus for a minute on our highest risk facilities, our nursing homes and other facilities like that. Uh, vaccination teams have now visited 89 out of 102 nursing homes, assisted living facilities and personal care homes. So, so far, almost all of them. And 45 of those sites have had two visits uh, and they vaccinated 10,100 residents and 8,050 staff. So our uh, facilities that have the most vulnerable residents now at least uh, almost entirely had at least one visit. And so we do think uh, that should reduce deaths in the future because that's where they're most likely to have occurred in the past. Now, back in the community, we are still in phase 1B, uh, and people who are eligible for vaccination are these frontline essential workers, as we talked about before, people over the age of 75, and people with high-risk medical conditions, especially cancer, chronic kidney disease, organ transplant, and diabetes. And let me talk about how vaccine is being made available, because this differs by all the different providers that, that have vaccine now. First, with hospitals. Uh, the hospitals are now inviting their patients typically those who are 75 or people who have those medical conditions in for vaccination at their facilities. Uh, each hospital is doing it somewhat differently, but to give you some sense of the numbers here, the University of Pennsylvania system has invited 20, <coughs> 28,000 people in for vaccination. Temple University's health system, 21,000. Uh, Jefferson Health System has a two-step process where people first indicate they're interested in getting vaccination and later indicate uh, the schedule. And they started with 48,000 people so the very large number of people who are being invited in by these hospitals. What I'm hearing is that overall about one in four or one in five people who is invited is coming in to be getting vaccinated. In addition to that process, which is an ongoing process, hospitals are running their own mass clinics in the, their communities. There's one last weekend run by University of Pennsylvania and Mercy, uh, one last weekend from Jefferson and others by Temple and Einstein that are underway. Each is doing it somewhat differently. In addition to that, we have federally qualified health centers and other clinics that serve low-income communities that are now inviting their patients in to meet these eligibility criteria. Each clinic is inviting in, on average, approximately 100 patients per week, inviting or, or vaccinating, I guess, 100 uh, patients per week. Then we have mobile teams out there visiting a variety of sites. And then we have the expanding list of pharmacies that are offering vaccination. So ShopRite has three locations, Walgreens, 11 locations, Rite Aid now 77 locations providing vaccine. Eligibility for these sites is people over the age of 75 uh, from the city of Philadelphia. Now we are inviting people who are over to the age of 75 who have registered at our vaccine interest database on our website in the past. Uh, the, those invitations have started going out and they will continue to go out. So we're asking people who are over the age of 75, uh, if you haven't, uh, you can seek vaccination at those pharmacies or you can go to our vaccine interest database and you'll get an invitation from us. We're asking, please do not try to get vaccinated at these pharmacies if you're under 75 right now. That will be later. We want to reserve these slots for people over the age of 75. Now, in addition to those chain pharmacies, there are other pharmacies that are enrolled. Some of them have vaccine and some of them, some of them will be getting vaccine in the next week or so. Uh, Sunray Pharmacy has 13 sites operating under different names. And Walmart and Acme, uh, Walmart has six sites, Acme has three sites. They'll be getting vaccine next week. And then there are four independent pharmacies, uh, Centennial and four others uh, that either have vaccine or will be receiving vaccine next week. Then there are mass clinics. Uh, there are clinics who are run by the health department at the convention center. As the mayor said, in the last two weeks, the health department has run the second dose clinics to match the first doses uh, provided by Philly fighting COVID. Uh, and during those clinics, we vaccinated over 6,900 people, uh, including in the last couple of days, uh, nearly 1,000 people per day. Uh, this Friday and Saturday, we'll be running clinics uh, back at the convention center. And this is, we've invited to these clinics more home health aides that have yet to be vaccinated. And these people are identified through our vaccine interest database, the people who have signed up and registered there. 
Then, as the mayor said, there's an ongoing series of community-based vaccination sites that will begin next week. As we said last uh, press conference, there are three sites that have been chosen so far, the Community Academy of Philadelphia Charter School, uh, the MLK Older Adult Center in North Philly, and the University of Sciences in West Philly. Now, tomorrow or Thursday, we will let people know the specific dates and locations of uh, those clinics. Uh, they're not open clinics. People can't show up there. They can't register on their own. We will be inviting people from our vaccine interest uh, database to schedule appointments in that. Those will be people who meet our phase 1B criteria. So we'll be sending emails and phone calls to people to invite them to sign up in the next few days. In addition to that, there are clinics run by the Black Doctors COVID Consortium. They're now doing about 2,000 people per week. And then starting next week, uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia will begin to vaccinate teachers, support staff, and child care staff. Uh, they'll start next week. They'll be putting invitations out there this week. And that includes public, private, charter schools, and parochial schools. So what should people do who want to have vaccine? Uh, remind you again, if you believe you're eligible because of your, the nature of your work, you think you're a frontline essential worker, talk to your employer. If you have, believe you're eligible because you have some medical condition or you're over the age of 75, check with your clinic or the health system where you get your care. Or if you're over the age of 75, you can check our pharmacies or anyone can go to our website, www.phila.gov slash vaccine interest. That's www.phila.gov slash vaccine interest and log in their information and then we'll notify you when you become eligible. Now, if you don't have internet and you can't register yourself at this point now, you can call 311 and people working there will sign you up for you on that database. So if you have no internet access, you could still get into our database. I also want to remind people that what we started last week was a sign-up form for organizations that have employees that they believe are eligible because they're frontline essential workers. Uh, that's www.phila.gov slash business vaccine. www.phila.gov slash business vaccine. Now, despite the name, that's for any employer of any size, not just for-profit businesses. Uh, and even for people, employers that don't necessarily have uh, workers who are eligible now, but may be eligible in the future. As uh, those organizations and those employees become eligible, we will notify them about the opportunities to get those employees vaccinated. Let me talk a little bit about the timeline here. You know, we know that many people in Philadelphia want this vaccine and many are frustrated that they can't get it yet. Uh, and when they know they can't get it yet, their next question is often, well, when can I get it? Uh, and we've been reluctant to answer that question because so much is unknown about how many vaccine doses we'll receive. But with the new federal announcement, for the first time, I think the numbers will enable us to give some estimates around this. But first, I have a lot of cautions here. There's still much guesswork involved. We don't know how quickly the doses of Pfizer and Moderna vaccine will arrive, uh, even whether the previous purchases or the new purchase announced just last week. We don't know about what other vaccines are likely to be approved. Uh, we don't know how quickly we can scale up the vaccine services to match that. And uh, we also don't know how many people amongst those eligible, eligible will choose to be vaccinated. Uh, it's entirely unclear how many people want this vaccine. We hope it's everybody. We're not sure, though. But I can say this. If that 600 million doses in the United States is available by the end of July, if that is available and if that is given to us here in Philadelphia, our share of that, I can estimate that we will be in phase 1B until approximately the end of April and phase 1C until approximately the end of May. And then we'll be in phase two, and phase two is then everyone is eligible uh, in June, and that we would reach everyone who wants the vaccine by the end of July. Uh, now that timing is in many ways positive because July is also when respiratory viruses spread, tends to hit the bottom, uh, tends to hit the bottom in the summer. So this all depends on the ability of Pfizer and Moderna to deliver the doses that they promised the federal government and for Philadelphia to get its share. Uh, but that gives people a rough sense of timing here. And again, don't hold into this because there's so much unknowns here. But if that's true, what that means is that we've had a very tough winter. It'll still be tough. Things will be improving in the spring, but there's real hope for the summer. Now, with that in mind, let me just move on now and talk briefly about uh, where we are with our safe at home restrictions. Uh, as you know, we eased back on restrictions for restaurants. In fact, of last week, we announced ventilation standards for restaurants that they could increase to 50% capacity if they had a very high level of ventilation that could be demonstrated in their dining spaces. So far, 60 resident restaurants have applied for that 50% capacity based on the ventilation standards. Uh, we are reviewing those. So far, 11 have been approved, 15 are still under review, and for 34, we're requesting additional information. Now, we know with this first uh, phase of applications, many questions are, are, have been raised. 
uh, and we have revised our application form to make it clearer on what information needs to be provided and how people can get that information. We've also produced a video to show people exactly how to measure their restaurant and how to calculate the numbers that are in that form. That video will be posted very soon. Now, these measurements can be done by an HVAC technician. Uh, that doesn't, if people don't feel like they have the expertise to measure, then they don't need to do that. But if the restaurants feel that they, they can do it, they can do those measurements themselves. It's at their option. Now, that's what's happening in restaurants. In light of the falling cases, we will consider easing other restrictions. I have nothing to announce today, but we will announce those other restrictions, uh, any changes in other restrictions as soon as we are ready with those. So what should people do now? Um, just remind people, please keep up the masks and distances, even if you're vaccinated, even if you're vaccinated, there's still plenty of infection out there. Keep up the mask and distance and no indoor gatherings of any sort. If you do get together with others, do it outside wearing masks. Uh, more information on all this is on our website, www.phila.gov slash COVID. Thanks. Thank you and, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, Dr. Farley, you talk about distribution channels and I, I, I know you've discussed this before, but I'd like your thoughts again. Uh, other cities are using their stadiums as vaccination humps. Why isn't Philadelphia? You're muted, Doc. Sorry about that. Uh, I think there is a value to adding to the current distribution channels, uh, very large high throughput mass vaccination clinics. Uh, I don't think the right place to put that in Philadelphia right now is a stadium, both because of the weather right now and because the stadiums we have are at one extreme uh, part of the city that reaches more people in the suburbs than necessarily in the city. We want people within the city to be vaccinated. Uh, but I do think that as we Get more doses in, we need to increase the number of vaccinated, adding uh, larger high throughput sites makes sense. You know, it's important to understand that we're not eliminating Lincoln Financial Field for some ultimate use in that regard. It's just not going to be the first one out of the box uh, for various reasons. Uh, and when, when do you believe that vaccine supply will catch up with the demand? Uh, and, and has the health department done anything specifically to consistently get more shots out of vials? Uh, so all the providers are, um, since the beginning, uh, in, in the first day or two, when we identified that you could get more shots out of uh, the Pfizer vial, uh, all, all the providers have been asked to do that, and they have to use a certain needle to do that. Now, the way that the Pfizer doses are counted, it's assuming that you can get that many doses out of that vial. So uh, even though the same vials, if the numbers we're you know, recording are, are higher than that. The, uh, and the, you can't get additional doses out of the Moderna vials, I, I don't believe, uh, although there is t talk that Moderna will be able to put more doses in those vials, uh, and that could bring about a substantial increase in the number of Moderna doses we receive. Uh, I don't know when that's going to happen, but that would certainly be welcome. And, and supply reaching or meeting demand, you, you talked about only about a quarter or 20% of uh, hospital appointments showing up. Um, but you certainly have more people in the queue than you have demand, right? When, uh, when absolutely. do you think the supply so, meets it? We don't know how many people in the city uh, really want to have vaccine now. National surveys show it's about two thirds. Uh, and so if we have 1.2 million adults, there's maybe 800,000 adults out there who really want to be vaccinated. And we vaccinated 150,000 so far. So the demand is, is way beyond that. So I gave you the timeline, uh, my best guess a minute ago, as to when we get to, to phase two. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be some time, but it's not forever now. It's, it's within a number of weeks we can start to see. Uh, and the, our ability to meet that demand depends on two factors. It's the number of doses that come into the city, and then also our ability to have the clinical services to meet that demand. Up until now, our limit really has been the number of doses, but it's shifting now to as the doses increase to be more on the uh, vaccine administration side. Uh, but we're increasing that as well. So we're going to both, I hope, will increase in parallel. Um, and then until we, and we meet that demand of two thirds, or I hope ultimately it's 90% want to be vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farley, and thank you, Mitch. Next up, we have Jeff Cole from Fox 29. Jeff, you should be able to unmute and ask your questions. Yeah, here we go. Questions, uh, at least to start for the mayor. Mayor, COVID and schools, the 22nd on Monday, so, uh, Dr. Height wants uh, students back into the classroom. Are Philadelphia students, 9,000 of them, going to go back to the classroom on Monday, in your view? Well, first of all, we're working with the district and the union uh, in an effort to 
work with the mediator uh, to make determinations on the safety of schools and which which the union thinks is not safe, which the the uh, district thinks are uh, the things that are in the MOU. We need to work out through the mediator. So, um, and we're also, as you know, going to going to start vaccinating both the staff, uh, frontline staff, teachers, principals, people who work in the buildings, and that'll start on Monday. And I think as we we move towards more and more people vaccinated, uh, discussions and resolutions on the buildings themselves, uh, I think we'll get where we need to be. Uh, so it's Tuesday. That sounds like a lot of work. Is Monday yes. even realistic then, a mayor, considering the mediator is still talking to folks? Well, th- this entire effort's been a lot of work. I mean, since last March, um, where, again, we can't physically force teachers back into schools. So we want everybody to go back with the right attitude and the right positive attitude and feel safe about the location that they're in, including the st- teachers and the students. So we're working, we're working our best every day. Our deputy mayor for labor, Rich Laser, is meeting with folks all the time. Uh, and we're moving towards getting that resolution. It's nothing's, this is not an exact science. It's more of an art uh, in trying to get people to feel that they're safe uh, and that uh, parents want to send their kids to school. I'm sorry, so, so what do we tell parents about Monday? Um, I'd have to get back to you on exactly what that message will be. I'm sure it'll be something later in the week. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Next up, we have Tim Check from Philadelphia Gay News. Tim, you should be able to unmute. Yes, this is a question for Dr. Farley. Um, Someone with AIDS has complained to me. They were turned away um, from getting the vaccine. Uh, Could you explain um, the the, um, situation with people with AIDS and why that's not considered a a health condition right now in this phase of the vaccine? So my understanding is, and I'll need to double check, that people who have immune deficiency due to HIV infection, so full-blown AIDS, are, are eligible under uh, the, uh, as, as high-risk criteria defined by the CDC, uh, but people who have HIV infection and have a normal immune system uh, because they're under treatment and most people with HIV infection are, uh, they would not be now. Uh, now, I would say being eligible in phase 1B doesn't mean you're going to get a dose right now because that there are many, many people, hundreds of thousands of people in phase 1B. I don't know the particulars of that individual person, but uh, even if they're eligible, it may be that they might have had difficulty getting vaccine like many others. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Next up, we have Maggie Kent with 6ABC. Maggie, you should be able to unmute. Hi, everyone. Um, So, again, I wanted to touch base, and I know this is, I don't know if you're going to love it or not, but I I just was in the fiscal meeting, and it is kind of coronavirus related. I understand that we're in a huge deficit right now. So what are the, some of the things that we're doing when it comes to coronavirus and, and getting back on track uh, to help this city out when it comes to next year's financial situation? Well, I'll let, I'll let Marissa and Rob jump in on the technical side of it. But right now, we're still waiting to see what the COVID relief package is going to be like. Uh, certainly, what has been pr- promoted by or announced by the president uh, is something that's intriguing and, and good for cities and states. The devil lies in the details as to whether or not there's going to be enough direct aid to cities and states, whether or not that aid is going to be flown, uh, funneled through the states to the cities or to the cities direct, how much it's going to be. Uh, so these are all unknown factors, although I think the framework is there uh, for us to be safe. But in the long, in the short term, we have to plan that if it goes off the if it goes sideways and off the rails, we still have the f- fiscal problem that we're facing. And we're hoping that the feds will be able to come somewhat to the rescue, but we have to prepare um, in, in the interim. Marissa? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, and just to give you a bit more of the specifics, this, this morning we uh, released information around a potential $450 million deficit in the upcoming FY22 budget for the city's general fund. Uh, and as the mayor mentioned, you know, we're optimistic about federal funding uh, being able to come in, but we still don't know about the timing, about the formula that winds up being passed, about how much will be allocated. Will it come directly to the city or will it flow through states? Um, and that adds a lot of uncertainty. But the second part of the challenge there is also that that $450 million gap is just this year, but because of the pandemic, we now have structural issues that are going to carry on for many years. Whereas we think any federal relief will be one time, 
Um, so even if the number for the federal relief is bigger than that $450 million gap, um, we're probably going to need to spend that relief out over several years, stretch it out so that we can, you know, not just get through a balanced budget this year, but across our five-year plan. And that's why we, we delay the submission of the budget so we have a better idea of where we stand. And then we'll enter the budget process, and that's and that's a process of its onto itself. Our council will express their priorities for the year. We'll have hard choices probably to make, and we'll have to hash it out between council, uh, their constituents, and administration. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Maggie. Next, we have Pat with KYW. Pat, you can all go ahead and unmute. <clears throat> Pat, you're unmuted, but we're not hearing you. I don't know if you want to try to. Sorry. I'm go. sorry. No problem. Um, I just wanted to clarify the numbers that Dr. Farley gave about the hospitals. Um, when you say um, Penn uh, contacted 28,000 and one out of four or five are interested. That means they vaccinated 7,000 or they uh, no, called 100,000. <laughs> uh, no, th th these are approximate numbers. Uh, they, they were not firm numbers, but this is what I got from conversations with their chief medical officers. So this is how many they sent out invitations to that many people. And then that one in four, one in five is how many scheduled an appointment in the few days after they got that invitation. So uh, I don't know how long it'll be for them to get that appointment done and to be vaccinated. Okay, and then um, I also had a question about signing up with pharmacies directly. I think last time you said the pharmacies were go using your registration list. Are they still, or can you sign up directly with? You know, each pharmacy is somewhat different uh, and uh, we, we are, um, some of them may have actually posted on public sites their sign up, other ones that may be private and we're directing them to them. Uh, and I don't have all that information, but we're, we're trying to have it be so that it's not so public that, uh, that they are, uh, their sites crash with people who are ineligible trying to sign up. So we're trying to direct the people who are uh, the most important, which are age 75 plus to them. Okay, and if somebody signs up in multiple places and then they get a shot, is there a way to remove themselves from the registration list or does it not matter? So we, we will be uh, reconciling our, uh, our vaccine interest database with our vaccine database and see who has been uh, vaccinated and then taken it from them. And that we haven't done that yet. Uh, so it may be that people will be receiving invitations who've already been vaccinated. Obviously, if you receive an invitation from us and you've already been vaccinated, then we ask you not to schedule an appointment. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Pat. Next up, we have Argenis Figueroa from Univision. Um, and just a note to everyone, we have about 15 minutes left and quite a few people to still get through. So as a courtesy to your colleagues, if we can keep the questions tight um, so we can get everyone's answered. Argenis, you can go ahead and unmute to ask your questions. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, we have two questions. Uh, the first one for the mayor. Um, Armando, me puedes ayudar con la traducción, por favor? Con gusto, Argenis. Entonces, Armando, la pregunta es para el alcalde uh, sobre si podría verse afectada su respuesta a la lucha contra el COVID-19 eh, basado en el déficit presupuestario que, que ya visionan para el 2022. Y yo sé que quizás no es eh, relativo al tema, pero si puede decirle a la comunidad hispana por qué es importante participar en, el, eh, en la consulta que están haciendo sobre el presupuesto. ¿Te refieres tú a la encuesta, a la sí, consulta que ha hecho la ciudad? Encuesta, sí. Bien, gracias. Para las prioridades. Como no, gracias. The question is for the mayor. Mayor, do you think that the city's response to COVID-19 will be affected by the projected budget deficit in 2022? And number two is, what could you tell the Hispanic community about the importance of participating in the survey that the city's put out in terms of the budget for 2022? Well, first of all, the second one, I think it's very important um, that they they participate in the survey. Uh, we want to hear from all segments of our communities, uh, especially our our, our uh, Spanish community, uh, and make sure that they have their uh, issues that they're important to them, uh, highlight them so we know when we're going through uh, our budget process that uh, 
their their wishes or their thoughts are taken in consideration. And what was the from sorry the first one was if you could estimate if there's going to be some sort of an impediment to your the city's response to COVID-19 in light of the budget deficit for 2022. I don't anticipate that. I I, I mean I don't see how it would directly impact it. I think what we're doing with the federal government and with the state government uh, with our injection with our um, vaccination sites, um, getting the doses in people's arms. Um, we'll see what happens as we go in to the budget process, but it's not anticipated. Uh, but if it is, we'll, we'll address it. Thank you, Mayor. Argenis, a respuesta a la pregunta con relación a la participación de la comunidad hispana en el sondeo con respecto a la confección del presupuesto para el año 2022. Obviamente, nosotros queremos que todos los ciudadanos de Filadelfia participen en la confección de este segmento. Necesitamos que todos los segmentos de la ciudad estén representados, especialmente la comunidad hispana. Queremos saber cuáles son los temas y problemas que quieren que se subrayen, y en manera que sepamos cuáles son sus ideas y sus inquietudes. Con respecto a la segunda pregunta, sobre si el impacto de una crisis o de un déficit presupuestario del año 2022 impactara en la respuesta de la ciudad contra la lucha del COVID-19, la ciudad no anticipa que haya un efecto directo y se está trabajando con el gobierno federal y el gobierno estatal. Están poniendo los lugares disponibles para que se den las inyecciones y las dosis de la vacuna lleguen a los brazos de los ciudadanos. Y si hubiera algún problema relacionado con el presupuesto en este esfuerzo, obviamente nosotros nos eh, pondríamos al nivel de las circunstancias y lo resolveríamos. Muchas gracias. Uh, the, uh, la segunda pregunta es para el doctor Farley, uh, para saber eh, cómo y cuándo planean abordar la vacunación de los desamparados. The second question is for Dr. Farley, and the question is, how and when do you plan to approach vaccination for the city's homeless population? Uh, you know, we are working with homeless shelters uh, right now and getting vaccination of staff and, and residents. Um, and um, I don't know the details beyond that, but that's that's uh, happening soon. As far as people who are on the street, that's going to be tougher. We'll get to them later. Nosotros actualmente estamos trabajando con los refugios para tratar de inocular a su personal y a los residentes. Y no tengo mayores detalles al respecto. Y más adelante, para trabajar con la gente que no está en los refugios y que está por las calles, lo tendremos que ver más adelante y resolverlo. Gracias. Vale, muchas gracias a ustedes. Thank you. Thanks to you all. Thank you, Argenis. Next up, we have Isabella Sanchez from Telemundo. Isabel, you can go ahead and unmute. Thank you so much, Armando. Eh, mi pregunta es para el Dr. Farley. Hemos recibido muchísimas llamadas de televidentes de la tercera edad con muchas condiciones preexistentes que dicen que registrarse ha sido una pesadilla. Eh, no tienen correo electrónico, no tienen acceso a computadoras, e incluso por teléfono se les ha hecho muy difícil ¿Qué tipo de ayuda o soporte se les está brindando a comunidades en las que la barrera de la tecnología y la barrera del idioma son un reto, ya que hay mucha gente que califica en la comunidad hispana y no ha podido vacunarse? Dr. Farley, the question is for you. We've received calls from a lot of TV viewers about senior citizens who are having a nightmare of a time trying to get registered for inoculation with the vaccine, be it because of issues with a computer or even through the telephone. What sort of support are there available? Uh, is there available for them in terms of technology and language access for those people who are eligible and are having such a hard time getting registered to get the vaccine? First, uh, let me be clear that there's uh, many people, regardless of what language they speak, are having difficulty getting the vaccine now. There's just a limited number of slots and many, many people who are eligible by being in phase 1B. Uh, but people who um, want to be in, in our database uh, don't have to sign up themselves, uh, they can now call 311 and we have people who speak Spanish there uh, who can get them registered in the database. And and um, any if for any community organizations uh, that uh, are helping people, uh, they can register folks for them. Anybody can go in the database and you can register someone else uh, and then we will reach out to them in, in, uh, uh, in Spanish. Thank you, Dr. Farley. Isabel, primero quiero que quede claro que hay muchas personas que están experimentando, experimentando dificultades para poder acceder al programa de vacunación, eh, sencillamente porque hay recursos limitados en cuanto a las dosis de vacunas disponibles durante la fase 1B en la cual estamos todavía. Sin embargo, esta base de datos que nos permite 
registrar a las personas que van a ser vacunadas eventualmente, se puede rellenar a nombre de otras personas. Es decir, las personas que están teniendo dificultad pueden llamar al número 311 y ahí encontrarán apoyo en español que les va a permitir registrarse para este eh, esfuerzo. También hay organizaciones comunitarias que están tratando de hacer esto y que pueden registrar a la gente en sus comunidades a nombre de ellas cuando tienen dificultades. Y obviamente esto es algo que nosotros, al tener esa información y al haber las citas disponibles, les comunicaremos su disposición o sus citas en español. Gracias, Armando. Quick follow-up. ¿Alguna organización con la que la ciudad esté trabajando de manera específica que atienda a la comunidad hispana? A quick follow-up question, Dr. Farley. Is there any specific community organization that you're working with with the Hispanic community? There's a number of organizations that we had conversations with, including like uh, coalitions of organizations we've talked to. No one single organization. Nosotros hemos estado teniendo conversaciones con muchas organizaciones comunitarias y con coaliciones de diferentes organizaciones comunitarias, ninguna en particular. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, next up, we have Jack Tomsick at the Metro. Jack, you can unmute. Right, thank you. Uh, this is for Dr. Farley. Uh, does the city plan to use the convention center as a mass vaccination site beyond the Philly fighting COVID patients and the home health care aides? And if so, do you know how many people you could do a day there? Uh, I would say the convention center is an excellent site for vaccination. And so I'm, I imagine we will use it in the future, uh, but exactly for whom, uh, I don't know. We don't have uh, specific plans for that yet. Uh, I do think there definitely is potential for a lot more. It's a huge space, uh, very well suited for this sort of thing. And um, another question I had is, is any, uh, how many people, do you have any data on how many people have been able to set up an appointment through the vaccine interest form? Uh, we don't. Uh, I can say that um, there, uh, we, you know, we just started inviting people from that vaccine interest uh, database uh, in the past few days, uh, but that we are sending out thousands of uh, um, notices to people on that just last week and this week. Um, for starters, um, uh, we should, by the end of this week, everyone in that database over the age of 75 should be given a notice about um, where they can go to register for an appointment. I'm not sure if they can all get appointments, but I'm hoping a good fraction of them will. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, now there are many people in the database. It'll take us a while to get through, through all of them, uh, but it definitely is we have started the process of getting those invitations out and, uh, and making that a, a worthwhile database. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Next up, we have Kennedy Rose at Philadelphia Business Journal. Kennedy, you can unmute. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time. My first question is from Mayor Kenny. I was wondering, um, what is the status of yours or even any city officials interactions with the group behind Operation Philly Special, uh, the group behind uh, wanting the mass vaccination site at Lincoln Financial Field? Have you had any conversations with them? Are you even entertaining speaking with them at this about this at all? I did not have specific conversation with them myself. Don't know if staff has, I could find out and get back to you. It's not that this thing, that this location has been eliminated. It's just not the, fir not the first one out of the box uh, for various reasons. Uh, and um, it will continue to be considered as a, as a place for mass vaccinations. Uh, as the vaccination uh, amounts ramp up, uh, and the weather gets better. Okay, and uh, my next question is for Dr. Farley. I was wondering uh, how many doses of the vaccine would you estimate the city would need to be receiving weekly for a site like Lincoln Financial Field to get the green light from the city? Again, it's not, uh, there's a, but the question assumes that the only place that we can have a large number of people come through is Lincoln Financial Field. And there are other options for that. And so the, the, uh, the reason we're not interested in Lincoln Financial Field right now has to do with the weather and the location of it. Uh, but that, that doesn't mean that there are other places we could do high volume vaccination uh, that, that don't have those problems. Okay, thanks so much. Have a good one. Thank you, Kennedy. Next up, we have Trang Do from CBS3. Trang, you should, can go ahead and unmute. Hi, thanks so much for taking my question. Um, I, two questions, actually. The first, I think Mayor Kenny or perhaps Dr. Farley could potentially answer this. Uh, we're just wanting to get some more details about the state of discussions uh, with FEMA to deliver vaccine to the city and when that might start. Doctor? I'm just saying we are in discussions with the federal government about um, large volume vaccination sites, nothing to announce final yet. Uh, but and, and those discussions 
uh, are, are, there's about the question of the sites and also question whether sites come with additional vaccine or whether the sites would use the vaccine we currently have. Neither of those have been uh, pinned down yet. Thank you. And my second question um, has to do with the restaurant ventilation standards. Yeah. Well, we spoke to a building engineer who held a seminar for a number of restaurant tours uh, yesterday, and it was his professional opinion that they're uh, a little bit cost prohibitive. And um, he would love to speak with you, Dr. Farley. I don't know if you received his letter, uh, if you do plan to speak with him, and perhaps if there are um, any considerations to maybe lessen these restrictions or, or um, modify them to make them more attainable while still allowing restaurants to operate safely. You know, we, in developing those standards, we talked to a large number of restaurants and we also talked to industrial hygienists who are experts in this. Um, and we also um, uh, went out and measured four restaurants in the city of Philadelphia. All four of the restaurants that we measured far exceeded those standards. Uh, so I've heard this before that somehow these were impossible to meet. And again, we were four for four. They far exceeded those standards. So I do think it's possible. Uh, we also, with the experts that we spoke to, uh, came up with a variety of uh, options for how restaurants can meet the standards that were not terribly expensive. Uh, so we're always interested in input. Uh, but again, our, our early take on this is these are things which are, are doable. Um, and that, uh, you know, we, we want this, the standards to be high. We want the ventilation to be high. So the people are safe. We do feel uh, that it's pretty comfortable, uh, that it's, we do feel comfortable. It's pretty safe for people to be eating outdoors. Uh, and so we say, what kind of ventilation do we need to have it be as safe indoors as it is outdoors? That's a very high level of ventilation. Uh, and I think uh, people eating at restaurants would appreciate the fact that they're meeting a very high level of ventilation to make it safe for them. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you, Trang. Next up, we have Johan Calhoun with Chalkbeat. Johan, you can go ahead and unmute. Thank you. Uh, two quick questions for Dr. Frawley and the mayor. Uh, can you give us an update on the mediator in Chicago? And do you expect an answer before Monday? I, I don't know about the mediator in Chicago. Um, um, I didn't hope to get an answer before Monday, uh, but the mediator, I mean, again, people work, are working very hard on this, are working long hours, worked yesterday during the holiday, uh, and there's a lot of information that needs to be sorted through. And we're hoping for an answer as soon as possible. Uh, and we're hoping we'll get one before Monday. But I don't understand. I don't know the Chicago issue. Mayor, he's just referring to the mediator being based in Chicago. The one Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's, he's based in Chicago. <laughs> I, I thought, thought you were talking about Chicago School District. <laughs> All right. no, I'm not sure exactly when. Hoping as soon as possible. Okay, now if teachers don't show up to school Monday, will they be disciplined? Because Dr. Hyde did mention that last time. I, and and yeah. will you ultimately make the call again when teachers go back, if they can go back or not? I don't want to see I don't want to see anybody disciplined. I want to get kids back in the classroom. I want teachers to go back in the classroom. Uh, there are schools that have been operating now uh, in both the parochial system and in the charter system that have been operating. Uh, we think that our hybrid model is safe. Uh, but again, I don't want to, to do this in a punitive way. Uh, we've been all, all been through a lot in the last you know year, uh, and uh, we everybody's scared, everybody's stressed, uh, and uh, you know adding more stress to that by quote unquote disciplining people, uh, I don't think gets us anywhere, and maybe maybe forebodes a, a longer term problem uh, with uh, management uh, staff personnel. Our school. Are school prepared um, to reopen February 22nd? Should they wait another week or two? We're going to have to see when we get there. This is not, I mean, you know, I know, I know reporters like to, to anticipate and predict. Uh, this is not a predictable situation all the time, especially with this, with this COVID, uh, with this, with this virus. Uh, so we're hoping, we're hoping the, 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 the mediator comes up with, with the plant, what comes up with uh, ruling. We hope that we can get teachers vaccinated, get kids back in school and get back to a normal classroom. But I, don't, I couldn't tell you for sure it's going to be on Monday. Good deal. Thank you. Thanks, Johan. Next up, we have Martin Pratt with Philly Your Black News. Martin, go ahead and unmute. Uh, yes, this question is for uh, Dr. Farley. Um, Dr. Farley, can you explain a little bit more about the process of ventilation? When I've talked to some restaurateurs, they were saying that their concern is that you're, we're just shoving the, the air particles along. We're not really doing anything to kill them. Like uh, some have mentioned buying these, uh, which I talked about last week, photocatalytic uh, 
catalyst uh, oxidators that actually that the NSA, I'm sorry, that NASA is using that actually kill the particles? Yeah, the, uh, there are three elements to the standards. There's the number of air changes per hour, that's how quickly the air is moving. Then there's the percent of outdoor air that is mixed in as it moves. Uh, and then there's the filtration. And so if you're moving the air a lot, then that means the air is very frequently going through those filters and the filters then filter out the droplets. So we don't think it's necessary to add on top of that some of these, which could be fairly ex expensive uh, systems that add UV light or whatever. You can simply filter out those droplets. And so we think this is a achievable uh, at, at a reasonable cost as well as being safe. All right, thanks, Martin. Next up, we have Matt Rothstein from BizNow, and Matt will be the final set of questions for the day. So Matt, go ahead and unmute. Hi, thank you. I just have one question actually for Dr. Farley. Um, so aside from the vaccines that are being distributed directly by the city through the convention center and the public clinics, uh, what criteria does the department use in determining how much vaccine each pro each separate provider gets? Uh, is it based in on capacity to distribute the vaccine? And if so, how is that capacity determined? So for each provider, we, uh, it, 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 let me say, yes, it is dependent, um, not entirely, but in large part on how many uh, doses we think that they can deliver. Uh, and that's based on how many they have delivered in past weeks and how many they believe that they may deliver in the future if they are just new and are just scaling up. Uh, and so we do have data on how many um, doses each provider is delivering each week to base that information on. Uh, yes, and so the determination of capacity is uh, taken from, is, is taken on faith from, from these providers? No, as I said, it's, we have data on how many they've delivered in past weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there is, you do factor in how many they say they can deliver the next week. Uh, and if we give them vaccine and they can't deliver it, then that would be taken into account in subsequent all allocations. Okay, so uh, would it be reasonable then to assume that each provider, uh, if it shows it's capable, can get more vaccine in, in subsequent rounds? Yes. Okay, thanks very much. And I should say, you know, we also factor into this uh, racial equity. The different providers mm -hmm. reach different populations. And so, for example, uh, that's, you know, we, we want to make sure that the federally qualified health centers are well stocked because they're reaching uh, low income uh, minority populations, immigrant populations that might otherwise be missed. Oh, sorry. And, and the last part of that is when, uh, you know, evaluating their claims on how much vaccine they can distribute is the amount of physical space or what building they're based in part of that consideration at all? Uh, only in their own minds. They can say okay. how many they, they can do uh, based on their staffing. And uh, the building's space is rarely the limiting factor. It's more uh, their staffing. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, everybody. That concludes today's daily press briefing. And if you have any other remaining questions, please send those to press at phila.gov. Thank you.